Hello and welcome to the live for tonight. This is Kim Howerton uh, and I'm happy to be here with you. Uh, it is Tuesday, July 5th. I hope everyone had a good Independence Day that lives in the United States anyway. And I'm glad to be here with you. I was just in the middle of recording my protein video, so I got through two thirds of it and uh, I'll have to finish up the rest of it. Uh, so finally, I keep recording it. This is like, I keep, I'm, I'm not the, I'm always like, no, that's not good enough. No, that's not good enough. I'm trying to, I really, baby, I really need to remember that done is better than perfect, right? Hey, David, nice to see you here. Welcome. Um, let's let some people join. I'm going to tell people about something that you might need to know about, which is my program Keto Unstuck opens on Sunday. Well, it's open for sale now. We start on Sunday. So if anyone is looking to get unstuck or fix what isn't quite working about their keto situation, then hop on in. I'll put a link in the show notes here. I, I'll put one in right now. And then I'll make sure it's at the top after we're done recording. But basically, it's a 12-week program about unsticking what's stuck. But I'm happy to talk about what's in it or just tips, free tips in this live tonight. So you let me know what you want to know. David, you'll be joining us. Fabulous. I'm happy to have you. Um, all right. Hey, Joni. Hey, 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 hey. I saw Lindy, Ms. Lindy. Hey, Lindy. How's it going? Sorry I won't see you this weekend in uh, Austin. I'm not going to KetoCon, but I'm sure you'll have a fabulous time. So if anyone's going to KetoCon, go meet Lindy. I'm sure she'll be there because she lives close enough. I stopped by Phil's Coffee today. If anyone has never been to Phil's, they don't have them everywhere, but they're a, they start in San Francisco, but you can find them in a lot of airports now. Very good coffee, uh, excellent cold brew, and they ha always have heavy cream. So for those of you that still put heavy cream in your coffee, they got it. They automatically make their coffees with heavy cream. They make, they put, they're one of those places where you're not allowed to do your coffee yourself. You have to tell them. Um, you know, what you want. And they, they unless you ask for something else, they'll put heavy cream in it. Um, so that being said, um, thank you, Rita. It's, I wish I bought like five of them. It's like it was on the Target clearance rack a few years ago. I love it. it and because it, it's not, I'm not hot. So I have, it's hot. Summer, crazy. All right. Um, uh, Jack asked, when is the weekly coaching session? So for Keto Unstuck, I do a weekly coaching session for everybody on Sunday around 3 p.m. Pacific time, 3.15. Um, but it's recorded and you can pre-submit questions. There you go. Karen says, I added more veggies back into my diet and I started losing weight again. Yeah, I do really well with a higher veg diet. So I as well eat more vegetables. I found when I added in more vegetables, I found it much easier to eat a lower caloric amount. Um, if I was just eating more carnivore or, or keto, I was struggling to not overeat. And I found adding back in vegetables, I wasn't struggling as much not to. And what's weird though, is when I first started keto, that was not true. When I first started keto, I found if I ate very many vegetables, I was hungrier. But then eventually I found more vegetables make me less hungry. So we are always a changing dynamic. Um, Brenda asked how to eat more protein. All right, let's talk about it. I actually recorded a couple of videos last weekend. I have like 12,000 videos in my phone that I just haven't edited yet. Um, on some high protein meals because people ask, what are some examples of what you eat? So I can tell you, I always aim to eat between 30 and 60 grams of protein in a meal for me to get the amount of protein in a day that I need because I eat a higher protein approach these days. Um, so, but I think everyone needs to at least eat 30 grams of protein in a meal. Um, and so that means that and by the way, that's at least people are like, Kim said we should only eat 30 grams. No, at least. Um, so a 30 gram protein meal might be a five pound ground, five pound ground beef burger, five pound, five ounce. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, people. Five ounce 
like 90% burger or if the higher the fat percentage, the, um, the, the more you'd need to get the protein. So, so meat as an example is water, fat, and protein. So it's those three things. So if you have a piece of meat, let's pretend this is meat. It's fair, don't eat meat this color. But if this was meat, this is like four pounds of meat, four pounds. Wow. I can't four ounces of meat in this little, you know, it's like a palm size, maybe probably a little more like five, but let's say four ounces of meat here. Um, the more fat it has, the less protein it's going to have because it has a certain weight and that weight is water, fat, and protein. So if you have less fat, it'll have more protein. If you have more fat, it'll have less protein because it's a limited amount of total substance, right? So if you choose, if you're trying to get enough protein and you choose a higher fat meat, that means you might need more of that meat to get a certain amount of protein. Whereas if you have a leaner meat, it is a higher percentage of protein. So like, let's say that the green is the fat amount and the blue is the protein, is the protein amount. So we can forget the water. It's in there, but. Um, and so if you have less fat, now you need to add more protein, right? Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. So there's a ratio. And so if you choose leaner, protein source, leaner meats, it'll have a higher ratio of protein to fat. You choose fattier meats, it has a higher ratio of fat to protein. And so you're just, you're just trying to find optimal in there. So, but I can tell you like a five to six ounce burger, which is not that big a burger. It's like a really reasonable burger. Um, and that's raw weight. Um, uh, Larry just asked, then you've got 30 grams of protein basically in that meal. So that's pretty easy. Or an egg is around six grams of protein. So six, 12, 18, 24, 32, five eggs will get you 32 grams of protein. Um, and so you can do that. Now, in terms of weighing your meat raw or, or, or cooked, remember I said meat is water, fat, and protein. The protein doesn't change when you cook it. The fat, some of it might run off, so that might lower the fat. The thing that changes the most, though, is the water content of meat. And so if you weigh the meat after it's cooked, you want to look up cooked meat. So take out your app, and because sometimes you're like, I cooked a roast, this big hunk of meat. And so to weigh it, I need to weigh it cooked. Then you're going to look up the cooked weight. But if you weighed it before you cooked it, you can look up the raw weight. Raw weight is slightly more accurate because depending on how cooked it is, the weight's going to change. But if you only have the cooked meat to weigh, then you can weigh that one. And you can estimate these things, but it's always good to, I think weighing things for a couple of weeks is a good idea just to, you'll start to be able to eyeball better. But I find if you just are eyeballing with never having weighed things, you tend to be wrong. So, hey, Dan. So, Yeah. Uncooked is more accurate, but we don't always have the uncooked weight. So that's why I say what, use what you got. Um, all right. We just got a creamy, by the way. Oh, no, sorry. I'm getting drawn off topic. Sorry. Other great sources of higher protein. Greek yogurt is very high in protein. You can also like skier, which is spelled S-K-Y-R. I found a skier recently that's amazing. So good. It's Thor is the brand, Thor's skier. Um, it's it's 19 grams of protein for just a little container. It's fabulous on the protein. You do get a few more carbs with Greek yogurt or skier than you do with meat, obviously, but it's pretty minimal if you, you can find different ranges. Like the Thor's skier was five grams of carbs for that 19 grams of protein. Um, uh, Faye yogurt is like five or six grams of carbs. So, you know, you can find the right balance. I, um, I use Greek yogurt as like a 
sour cream substitution. So I make sauces with it. I eat it with some as a dessert. So that's a way to just kind of bump up that protein because you can imagine if you have, I'm going to make like a, 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 a lettuce wrap and I throw a little sauce I made with some Greek yogurt out on it, I can get another three or four or five or six grams of protein into that. Whereas, you know, which it, it all adds up. So really, if you're eating six to eight ounce pieces of meat, which is not that much meat, um, and that weight, again, that's raw, you're definitely exceeding that sort of 30 gram per meal threshold of minimal amount. And from there, you just eat a little bit more of it. But some like tips and tricks to just bump that protein up. Greek yogurt is my number one favorite. Um, but there's also like the Maria Emmerich protein sparing bread. But I like um, Indigo Neely's version, which is it has a few other ingredients in there. I just think it makes a better loaf. Uh, it's, it's not as uh, dry. So I'll put the link in the notes after the video, but it's Indigo Neely's version of the protein bread. And she's got a YouTube channel and she's also got it up on her website. If you make things with that bread, it's pretty much protein. And so like, if I use it as buns on a little burger, then that bumps up the protein as well. So it's just these little tricks, like build your meal around a nice piece of meat, and then add a small amount of protein, little, little on top of that. Um, all right, I missed some, so let me get back. Um, Tammy says, do I limit caloric intake? Roughly 90 grams protein a day, fat until satisfied, and 20 grams of carbohydrate. What about calories? So um, now I will answer that question. Um, so I do limit caloric intake. I um, aim my caloric intake dependent on what my current goals are. So do I think everyone needs to like, like consciously limit their caloric intake? No, a lot of people can just intuitively do it. So for a lot of people, they might just limit the carbohydrates, excuse me, it, you know, limit the carbohydrates and eat sufficient protein and eat fat to satiety. And, and when they do that, they naturally uh, eat in a caloric range that suits what their goals are. That seems to just naturally happen to a lot of people. Does not naturally happen to all people. And so for people that plateau or stall, I do recommend they start looking at caloric intake at that point. And so that was me. And so I started paying more attention to caloric intake. And I found that was a very beneficial strategy. So I started keto, didn't pay that much attention to caloric intake initially, um, and lost quite a bit of weight that stalled out for years started paying more attention to things like more protein and um and and the calories and then re and then began to lose weight again after doing something called a reverse diet that was helpful so i do caloric manipulation to get the outcome fat loss or maintenance that i'm looking for so like i said i think some people who they just their their hunger signals match up with their intake better and so they can listen to hunger more. And then other people, if they're doing that and it's not working, need to maybe look into more detail around calories. But if something is working for you and it's less work, do that. But some of us can't get away with that. Alexandra said, do I recommend a protein drink? Like, do I recommend everyone use a protein drink? No. Do some people get a benefit from adding a protein drink in certain circumstances? Possibly. And so those are different questions, I think. I think most you're always better getting your protein from whole foods. Almost always. Um, that being said, if you can't, because think about it this way. Food is how we get all of our macronutrients and our micronutrients. If we're eating whole foods like steak, when we get that protein in the steak, we're also getting some fat, which is essential. We're also getting some, you know, geez, we're getting some B12, we're getting iron, right? We're getting all these micronutrients. 
If you drink a protein shake, you're just getting protein. Although keto chow adds vitamins to theirs, but for the most part, so you're almost always better off with that whole food because you get all the good stuff with it, not just the protein. That being said, for certain health conditions or just where they cannot eat that much volume of food, then I would say potentially a supplemental protein drink could be useful for some people. I'll say it that way. Um, Docs and Gal says, I found I have to add fat to feel better. I also had to adapt the concept, not all about calories are the same and stop thinking about calories. Absolutely, not all calories are the same. That is absolutely 100% true. And when I say I had to start paying attention to calories, fewer calories is not always better. I, I, I hope you can understand that. Yes, less calories does produce more fat loss. But if you're chronically under eating, you will find fat loss harder. So you have to do this in a measured, appropriate uh, approach. You can't just be like, cut all the calories and that'll be the best thing ever. That's not, that's not what you want to do. You need to understand how they work, that not all calories are the same, and that we do have some minimal needs. So, um, so that's there. Uh, Tally says, I have to count calories. I don't have the natural satiety. I eat until I'm too full, but after eating more veggies, it's helped. Yeah. For some people, more veggies adds to that satiety. Ashley said, I just got some protein powder for the first time. Would you suggest using it for things like waffles or other foods or putting in your coffee? Um, so yes, I use protein powders in cooking a lot. Uh, I used to be kind of anti-protein powder, by the way, but I've learned and grown. Um, so I don't love drinking my calories. It works for some people, but I like more food and I like things that make me for, feel more satiated. Um, and so I will pref preferentially bake with protein powders than use it in a shake. And so I like it. I do it. I do it a lot. So it's a good way to add a little more protein into your world. So, but what I'll often do, right, is I'll take a, you know, if I'm doing a baked good, I'll mix eggs with the protein powder. I'm getting more nutrition because I'm getting eggs with that. I'm getting other things in, in the recipe and I'm not exclusively eating baked goods. Although some days I would like to, it's my day is not just a solid festival of um, protein chocolate cake. So I, I mix it up, but I think you can safely include some protein powders in your baked goods. Absolutely. Um, I prefer to bake with a combination of whey and casein, which is the two dairy proteins. So that's Keto Chow or PE Science is another brand that has that combo. I find the textures better. Um, Tammy said, hold on, thirsty. What diet reversal? Now, um, I thank good listening. I said it really quickly. Um, what did I say? Um, wow. It's like a Swiss cheese hole in my brain. Um, reverse diet. There we go. I was like, diet reversal sounds so close. A reverse diet. So a reverse diet is sort of the opposite of a diet. Uh, we Although diet in the sense of weight loss diet. So during a reverse diet, you strategically increase your calories to try and raise your caloric ceiling so that you're getting a higher caloric intake and hopefully pushing up your metabolic rate slightly. It can be useful for a lot of people. Um, and so it's part of what I teach is this nutritional periodization. So periods of doing different things, maintenance for a while, uh, caloric reduction for a while, and maybe some uh, reverse dieting thrown in there. So for me, I took, I think about nine months. It's like somewhere, I said a year, but I, when I look at it, it's probably more like six to nine months where I focused on not losing weight. I focused on, you know, maybe a small amount of weight gain was okay. And just eating more and pushing that ceiling up and up and up, trying to get to be able to eat as much as possible in terms of my caloric intake without gaining an inordinate amount of body fat. So that was my goal there. And then at the end of that period went on a cut and from that lost a significant amount of body fat um, which I had been unable to lose prior to doing that. So it was it was helpful from a metabolic standpoint. Terry said, I had to focus on calories along with cutting carbs. I didn't need to count calories till I hit 92 pounds down. And now I'm 149 pounds down with meat-focused keto. 
Great job, Terry. I think you've done an amazing job. Uh, Ashley said, the best way to get more protein if you have aversions. I'm assuming you mean meat aversions, which do happen, especially in pregnancy. Those those can definitely happen, but they happen beyond that as well. I'm not suggesting you're pregnant. Um, I do not have that mental power to know that. And I know who you are. Uh, so is, uh, is that you would, um, things like I mentioned earlier, you can do baked goods with protein powders. Um, so like I make, I make a chocolate cake with chocolate protein powder. It's delicious in my mind. I make frosting with Greek yogurt and some protein powder mixed in and some cocoa. And I find it very delicious and satisfying. You can do things like shakes. You can do things like eggs, which has a different texture. You can look at different meat textures. Some people are like, I can't chew a steak, but I can do a hamburger. Some people are like, I can do bacon, but I can't do sausage, right? So find what works for you. Um, maybe you like chicken or maybe you like soups or, you know, maybe you like a puree. Um, like I make a, a, a chicken spread, I call it. It's basically a pureed chicken salad. It comes out like the texture of like tuna fish. It's not like textureless, but it's not very chewy. And you, you know, so you can do little experiments like that to see what you like. Um, but eggs are a great other option. You can do like the protein sparing modified fast bread is very high protein. So you can find just working with your textural issues. Tammy says, but when you ate more, did you still limit carbohydrate? I did. I did, Tammy. So I, during my reverse diet, I was keto. Um, I was probably between maybe 30, 30, maximum 35 grams of total carbohydrates during that period. Um, reverse diet just means more calories. It doesn't mean more uh, carbohydrates necessarily, though some people might view it as such because reverse diets are not specific to uh, keto. People not keto will do reverse dieting as well. It's just referring to energy, more energy calories. So both carbs and fats are energy calories. And so what someone doing a reverse diet on keto, this I learned this working with um, keto savage Robert Sykes, who is a keto bodybuilder is, you know, you keep your protein amount, what you need, you need your, you need protein. So you keep that. And then you start bumping up the fat intake to get the calories up during that reverse diet period. You have to do it carefully and slowly. If you just suddenly go from eating 900 calories to 1800 calories, you're going to gain a lot of weight. So you have to do it a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, and just slowly bump it up. Um, Christina says, will you post the recipes you mentioned using protein powder brands, et cetera? Sure. I'll put, I'll, I'll post that. I think I might've done it on my Instagram somewhere, but I do, I'm, I am late in putting a lot of recipes up, up. So I will try and get to that. Christina, you can remind me if I forget, but yeah, the, the, the chocolate cake, I think I got pretty good. So I'll tell you about that one. Um, David says, once you find your maintenance calories, how many calories would you use for a cup period? Well, if you're in my program, you're going to learn about that, David, but I'll tell you kind of depends. It's a, it's a bit more about percentages than it, you know, in terms of like, if you're, cause some people are like, Hey, my maintenance calories are 1200 calories. That's very low. But let's say your main, some, one person's maintenance calories might be 2000 calories. Someone else might be 3000 calories. The amount of calories I might cut for one person is different than the other person. Um, but you can approximately I would say on average, a lot of people do well reducing between 250 and 500 calories a day from their maintenance intake to see some degree of progress in terms of weight loss. Um, again, though, that's going to be if you're on a ketogenic diet, that's mostly coming from fat. Rather, you don't want to reduce protein unless the protein was really wiggy to begin with, because you need protein for your structure your body's structural elements. Protein actually becomes a, a, a macronutrient you need in a higher ratio um, during a fat loss phase because we need to maintain as much lean body mass as possible as we're losing weight. And the two things that help us retain lean body mass in a deficit are resistance training and proper protein. So I look at it like, you know, a relationship. If you don't tell your partner that they are needed, they'll leave you, right? You have to show them, well, not tell them, but show them that they're needed. Um, 
not in a weird way, but in a loving way. And your muscle is the same. If you don't show it that you need it by using it, it's going to leave. So you need to use it in some form of resistance training. All right. This talking makes me thirsty. So through my reverse, I was still keto. My carbs were very low. At the end of my reverse, when I went into my cut, so a cut is a period of time when you're trying to lose body fat. Um, when I went into my cut, I actually strategically upped my carbohydrates at that point as an experiment to see what happened. And that's how I transitioned from being purely keto to more of what I would call a high protein, low carb, because I found at that time, at which time I was already metabolically healthy, I'd improved my metabolic health through my keto journey. And so by the time I needed to lose that last bit of weight, I was like, oh, I am metabolically healthy. Let's see what I can do on a more slightly higher carb intake. So I don't eat I mean, not regularly. I don't regularly eat carby carbs. I eat more vegetables and some fruits. Um, so there you go. Um, and that was because I was experimenting and I found it, it suited me. And so I think sort of there's a lot of options on that low carb spectrum, depending on where you stand in terms of where you are with your insulin resistance level. So I'm not going to hear, I am not here to tell anyone that they should eat more carbs. But I am here if somebody says, I want to eat more carbs. I want to see what happens if I eat more carbs and to do so in a manner that is responsible. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Rita, Ashley said, uh, Doc, yeah, so many of you. Docs and Gal says, I literally don't count much of anything. I eat less than 20 carbs a day. I stick to fatty meats. If it is working for you, Docs and Gal, I support you. Uh, it's all about the outcome, right? I mean, I can tell you like, well, when they did this study on average, this worked best for these people. But there's always people, right? It's like, it looks like snow, right? Like different dots in different places. And then they take the averages. And we're all individuals, not averages. So we all have to do what works specifically for us. But if you're like, I have no idea what to do, I can tell you what the average thing is so that you can have some sort of framework for what works for the average person. Um, Ashley says, will I be doing or going to any keto events this year? Yes. Um, I will be going to the next one I've got is keto summit Orlando in Orlando, Florida. I think that's the first, the first weekend in August. Then I'll be at Dr. Barry's event in September. Uh, I may or may not be somewhere else in September, but I'll announce that when I know. Uh, and then I'm sure I'll be doing something after that, but those are the ones I know about in the upcoming season. Um, Rita says, I hear a lot of people who have lost weight on keto and gotten off the wagon, have gotten back on keto and had a hard time losing weight. What's your take on that? Yes. Yes, indeed. That's true. Um, regained weight is harder to lose. So the number one thing you want to do is not regain the weight. It is very important. Do not regain the weight. I will, I say this and most of you are like too late, right? I get it. If you, it, it's not insurmountable if you have, but you are much, so let's say you have a hundred pounds to lose. You are much better off losing 50 of those pounds and maintaining there for a while before you lose more weight. than you are losing all a hundred and then gaining back 50. That person who lost 50, then hung out there for a while and then attempted to lose more will have an easier time than the person that lost 100 and then regained 50, right? It's harder to relose gained weight. So your focus should always be like your bottom line should always be maintenance rather than, um, you know, but I'm not saying it's impossible if you have, but yes, it is absolutely true that it is harder to lose regained weight. Um, Angie said, what fruits have you incorporated? Well, any fruits that I really want, um, but not on the regular. Uh, like I don't really eat mango or pineapple much. They're pretty high sugar. I don't eat grapes. I try to avoid the high, high sugar fruits. I mean, like if I had them once a year, I wouldn't freak out, but I don't buy them. Um, if I was at a party, would I have like a piece of pineapple? Probably. But like, like I said, I want to buy them because I, I would potentially eat more than I'd want to, but I regularly buy 
berries still. I eat, I just eat more berries than I used to. I'll have maybe a half an apple every now and again. Um, what else? When it's cherry season, I eat a couple cherries because I love cherries. It's not cherry season all the time. So I'll eat cherries. Oh, I love nectarines. And so while it's nectarine season, I'll eat a nectarine. Um, so I go with like what's delicious and seasonal. Um, and then other than that, it might be a half an apple, some berries, things like that. My total carbs are usually under about 50 to 60 a day. They're not really high. Uh, some of you who are doing net carbs, your carbs might be fairly similar. Um, Andrea says, what, how can you tell when you're no longer insulin resistant? So there are a couple of things. The, so here's the, 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 the main metabolic health issues. So we've got, um, these things correlate with insulin resistance or metabolic syndrome. Um, you want your waist measurement to be less than half your height in inches or whatever, centimeters, whatever. So if I'm, if I am, uh, how tall am I? If I'm 69 inches, which is five foot nine, right? 60 inches, is five feet. Yeah. Then my waist, I don't want any more than 34.5. Cause that's half, right? 34.5 is half of 69. Yes. Math. Um, so that's one marker right? Well, you want your waist to be less than half your height. And that's your waist waist. So up at the top of your hip bones, uh, some people will say it's at your belly button, but any of us who've been very overweight or pregnant, your skin stretches out and then your belly button is lower. So my belly button is somewhere around my lower hips right now. And so that's not your waist. So um, if you've always been thin, or maybe you're a man who didn't ever have a gut, your belly button might be a good gauge, but in women or people who've had a large belly at some point in their life, go with the natural waist. So that should be no more than half your height. So that's one. Number two, your uh, blood sugar, your your A1C should be lower than 5.4. Your um, fasting glucose should be under 100. Your... Um, Blood pressure should be over under 120 over 80. Your, um, I'm trying to remember, your HDL should be over 50 as a woman and 40 as a man. I think these, I'm trying to remember these off the top of my head. Um, blood, blood pressure, waist. Oh, your triglycerides should be under, well, they say 150. I say under, under 100. So those are like the basic measures. Then your um, fasting insulin should be under six as a maximum, but more likely five. And your C-peptide, I like to see definitely under two, but probably under 1.6-ish. Um, all those things together would paint the picture that you're pretty metabolically healthy. Um, Christina said, I lost weight on keto, maintained for a few years, then gained back almost all the way I started. Tips on what to do and what to eat when restarting. So the first thing I would say, Christina, is just um, start eliminating all processed foods from your diet. So you want to, and I don't mean like sausage. I mean, obviously like breads and crackers and cookies and that kind of thing. Um, and just work on getting the carb level down. You can do it gradually if that appeals to you, or you could do it more quickly, but get the carb level down, eat foods that are high in fat and protein to um, to uh, be satiating. So focus on things like bacon and eggs and steak and chicken and all that kind of good stuff. And just focus on kind of changing your food landscape for a while. And once you've eliminated a lot of the junk food and a lot of the higher carb foods, the higher processed foods, you'll probably find it easier to kind of continue on the path. So I would say just take that step-by-step -step approach. Docs and Gal, your advice is needed as people move through life and body changes and stalls. I was feeling bad after being keto for a long period, being ketovorous helped. Yeah, absolutely. Change it up. Do what works for you. I am not against any approach that works for somebody at all. Ja uh, Jack says, is low carb cruise a possibility? Oh yeah, I'm going to be speaking. I, this is kind of far away. It's like a year away, um, but I should be on the low carb cruise. I was actually supposed to be on the cruise this year, but I got sick. So I'll be there next year. They just transferred my uh, my my ticket over. So I should be there next year. 
Tammy says, I thought I was getting there with metabolic health, but apparently not. You know, it's a step at a time. It's a step at a time. I do find the waste thing is the last one to fall into place for most people. Now, there are some people who can't get there like on HDL or something like that, because specifically HDL, can, there can be people that have some genetic issues that lowers their HDL. So that one is more one I'd be like, you know, do your best. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to keep you out of the club just because of that one. But you kind of, those are, those are the factors that, that medicine has sort of said, you know, could know whether or not you have a good level of metabolic health. Cheryl says, I'm doing 30 to 40 carbs per day, protein about 87 grams, sometimes over, fat around 60 to 80. I eat 12 to 1300 calories. I weigh 129, losing very slowly. Body composition, I assume that says, hasn't changed. Still belly fat. Um, do I eat too much fat? I gain. Cheryl, are you very small? 129 pounds is kind of low. So I'm going to guess you're of short stature. Um, Tammy says A1C 5.1 LDL fine, but mm, that waist thing. I know it was the last one for me. It's the last one for me, Tammy. And I like literally just made it there like in the last 10 pounds. So it took a while. Um, Christi Christina says low carb cruise. Share more about this. Okay. So this lovely woman named uh, Debbie Hubs puts on the low carb cruise. I think it's lowcarbcruise.com is probably, I'll put a link in here. Um, but if you just Google low carb cruise and then Debbie hubs should be involved. Um, and it's a annual cruise where we don't have the whole ship. It's just, um, a group of us on a bigger ship. So it's not like you're like, yeah, when you go to the buffet, it's not like only keto choices, right? But there's a group of people who are low carb and keto who do a, a, a cruise together. And it's a conference slash cruise. So on the days there at sea, there are talks by people like me um, or Nurse Cindy. And um, we do a talk on a topic. And then the rest of the time, you know, when we're, we go to shore excursions and we do dinner together. Like we all sit in the same area. They, they arrange that for us. And Debbie handles all the details. She's a travel agent. And so it's a, it's a week. Uh, I think the next one is in June and it goes to like Honduras and warm places. And, um, and it's, you know, it's a good time. So if you want to do a cruise and you like cruising, you can look up the low carb cruise and get, get connected to that. But it's, it's a fun time. Um, Cheryl says, yes, I have belly fat. Yeah, I carry my fat in my belly too. So it took a while to get there. And I still have some belly fat. Certainly could be used to lose a little more. It's all relative. Um, and so uh, Alexander says, do you fast? I realize fasting and keto can reset my body. I don't fast. I mean, I do and I don't. I do, um, I do intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating, but just mostly for other reasons reasons beyond fasting. One of which is I think not eating before bed is very helpful for sleep. So I don't eat late at night. And then I'm not super hungry first thing in the morning. And I usually have some stuff to take care of. So I don't eat super early and I don't eat super late, which means I eat in a time restricted window. But if I woke up starving, I would eat. And if suddenly before bed, I was starving, I would eat. I don't, I don't hold that, you know, sacrosanct. I, um, I, uh, but I generally probably eat in between an eight and a nine hour window, depending on the day. And I, I am, but I'm not like timing it. Um, and I do think fasting can be beneficial for a lot of people. Um, I think I do. I certainly agree with eating discrete meals and not eating between meals. I'm very anti-snacking for a lot of reasons. I think we need opportunities for our gut to digest rather than to constantly be challenged. Um, but I, um, also am somebody who came to keto with, um, a history of binge eating disorder. And I find for a lot of people, um, who had binge eating disorder, they find longer fast too triggering. And so I don't support them for people that don't want to do them. Say it that way. So if you're like, I love fasting and I want to fast, I think great. And I support people who want to do that. I also don't think they're necessary for everybody. So if they freak you, if you're like, I do not want to do it, it does not sound appealing to me. 
then you do not have to do them. I think it worked differently for different people. Uh, um, so Cheryl said, yeah, okay. Yeah, so it sounds like you do have some belly fat to lose and you just keep on keeping on. Uh, you're pro, okay. By the way, I'm just somebody talking on the internet. Please don't take anything I, t I say as medical advice. I am unqualified to give any medical advice because I am not a medical professional. So just saying that just across the board. Um, Cheryl, okay, I'm looking at your info here. So your protein is like minimally appropriate. I certainly wouldn't eat less if you were my client. Um, and your fat gram, I mean, your, your caloric intake is low. I would say you might be a candidate for a careful approach to a reverse diet. Also, if you're not doing resistance training, you should be doing resistance training. Uh, you might be in what we'd call a um, somebody who is uh, has a a low lean body mass uh, compared to what it should be. If you still have that large uh, belly circumference. Um, because if you, the more fat mass you have compared to lean mass, it's going to, you might be at lower weight, but your body composition is still off. So great. You're training super. So I would potentially look at a period of reverse dieting into maintenance, work on gaining more muscle mass, and then maybe doing a cut at that point. So definitely, um, you know, the small, the smaller of you have some challenges because you'll be like, well, my weight seems pretty low, but you know, in, in the, in the, in the great grand scheme of things, it can be, it can be a challenge to get that down below a certain uh, type. Um, skinny legs. Got it, Cheryl. Yeah. I would say, yeah, working on muscle mass, um, and then maybe a period of reverse dieting might be beneficial because when we're in too deep a deficit, when we're eating too low a calorie, even if we work out a lot, we're not going to add muscle mass, right? Because you need enough calories to support your body adding muscle mass. So if you're eating in two, there, there was a study that was done and they found, you know, by the time you get down to like a 500 calorie deficit below, you know, what your maintenance should be in a person that's not obese, which you're not, you're just in the overweight category, um, I believe, uh, those people will struggle quite a bit to put on any muscle mass. It, it's sort of, it, it's it's graduated. So if you're in a slight deficit, you can put on a little more, but by the time you get very low, you're just not going to see that muscle mass increase. So you might want to look at a period of reverse dieting with increased um, resistance training to try and add a little more muscle mass and then go into another cut to lose that kind of last uh, 10, 15 pounds or so. Um yeah, and that'll help. More exercise, uh, more muscle mass will definitely help with the insulin resistance. Increasing muscle mass can absolutely help with that. Um, Jack says, if I recall, uh, it's June 4th, the low carb cruise is June 4th through 11th out of Galveston, Texas. Yes, goes to Mexico and Honduras. Yes, that sounds right. Tammy says, exercise is like a bad four letter word. I used to feel that way, Tammy, but maybe don't think about it as exercise. Uh, think about it as moving your body. So, um, or doing things you like, picking up heavy things and putting them down, right? Like I don't like exercise, but I do like um, certain activities, right? I like, uh, and I do like lifting weights occasionally. So uh, finding things that you enjoy. Maybe you don't like the Stairmaster because only psychopaths like the Stairmaster. Um, just kidding. Uh, but I do like dancing, right? And so there are things that you can do that you like. And I think if you're, it's, it's always about better than before. It doesn't have to be about perfection. Like, okay, real talk. I saw like an influencer the other day, you know, on one of the YouTube people. I will not name names. But they did a video on like, is evening exercise or morning exercise better? And I was like, dude, I think most people watching your channel don't exercise at all. So perhaps a discussion of is morning or evening better is just sort of covering up the underlying, just do something, right? Like do something. 
so something is better than nothing. Don't perseverate. Don't worry on the details. Just do more than yesterday, right? And so it's not like exercise. It's not like you have to wear the headband and the lycra and the whatever, right? You don't have to look like Jane Fonda in the in jazzercise, right? Just go for more steps. Do more walking. Uh, go for an after a 10 minute walk after every meal. Walk around the block. Enjoy the evening, right? Those are better than nothing. So do more, not do all is the answer in my mind. Larry says, talk more about Keto Unstuck. Okay, I did not pay Larry to say that. Um, how long is the program cost details? Okay, it is 12 weeks. It, it starts on the 10th, which is Sunday. And it's 12 weeks in which we look at um, what's not working. Is it more of an issue of... Um, compliance? Like, are you struggling to not eat off plan? Or is it like, I think I'm doing everything right, but it's not working. We work with both types of people. Then we've got like, okay, well, if it's, if it's supposed to be working, but it's not, what are you doing? Let's analyze it. Let's pull it apart. Let's look at calories. Let's look at macronutrients. Let's look at activity. Let's look at all those things. What is happening that's making it not work? And then how do we fix that? So we work through all of that during the program. If it's more of a, I can't stay on track issue, then what we look at there is how do we get your habits uh, and, and mindset aligned properly to get you back on track and to make you stay on track. And so those are the different kind of types of people that, and their approaches that join. And then from there, the details would be, we have a Sunday call every Sunday of those 12 weeks. It's all on a group basis, but I'll work with people individually. This is confusing. Everything is done in the group, but I will give individual advice within that group, Larry. So sometimes we'll email, but mostly it's, it's, um, it's, it's group, but it's not all just one direction. Like somebody will ask me a question, I will respond to their question with individualized information, if that makes sense. But the coaching is a group coaching call rather than a one-on-one -on -one coaching call. And so we have that 12 weeks of coaching. If you can't make the Sunday call, I accept questions in advance. Um, and then I talk about the answer on the call and they're all recorded so you can watch them. And then there are also lessons all through the program talking about macronutrients, calories, what should I worry about? What about activity? What about body fat? What about body composition? What about, you know, this? What about that? So going through all those frequently asked questions that my clients have had over the years to take care of those needs. So it is $297 for the entire 12-week program. You can pay monthly if you need to. It's $107 a month uh, if you break it up. There's It's a little bit more if you break it up because there's some service charge on that. Um, and that's the program. And most people are very happy. And if anyone ever chooses to retake it, because I do have some people that are like, ah, I need a touch up. Can I come back in? I always give them a big discount to come back in. So if you, and then I also have a, a monthly membership. So if someone at the end of the program is like, I want to check in with you every once in a while, they can just hop into the very inexpensive monthly membership from there. So they have continued access to me. So you get all of that. You also get some recipe books. You get how to create your own meal plan, you know, all that kind of stuff. Because I'm very much about teach a man to fish instead of give him a fish. So I don't give meal plans. I teach how to do meal plans because I have people who never figured out how to eat because they only use meal plans. So I want you to figure out how to eat that works for you on an ongoing basis. And so what I teach in this program is not about these are the 12 weeks in which you're going to lose weight. I teach these are this is the information you need for the rest of your life to lose weight because it's not all going to happen instantaneously for everybody, but how do you set that up? So that's what I teach. And I teach things like reverse dieting, like the ins and outs of it, maintenance versus a cut, like all of those different periods that you'd want to go through. Heather says, how do you know when you've reached your ideal weight? I'm five foot two, big boned, um, DEXA scan, 50% fat. How do I know when I've arrived? Well, I'm out of juice. No. Um, all right. So here's what we got. There is no such thing as an ideal weight for a person. There is an ideal weight range for a population. What there is, is an ideal body fat percentage and an ideal muscle mass, right? So what we're going to look at as a person. So we've got 
got a person. We've got a little green person. You see that line? I don't know if you can see that line. We got, we got, or, oh, we'll just do the green and the blue again, right? So we've got body fat and we've got everything but body fat. This is fat-free mass, which is also called lean body mass. And then we've got the fat mass, right? A person needs some body fat and then they need a lot more lean mass. I will say that um, as you're older, having a little bit more fat is appropriate than younger. So there, that can shift a little bit. But I will say that um, pretty much being over 35% body fat is going to be increasingly unhealthy. So I would say that almost every, and by the way, men or women are different. I'm talking about women right now because your name is Heather. So I'm going to assume you're female. Um, so I'm going to say that I would like to see every woman under 35% body fat. Does that mean that a little bit less might be a little bit better? Yes. But, you know, we're going in stages here. So if, if somebody comes to me and says, my body fat is 50%, I'm going to say, let's get you to 35, right? And then when you're at 35, I'll probably say, let's get you to 30, right? And so just those increments. Now, for most women over their 20s, 30% might be fine. Um, there's not a lot of increased health risks being 30% versus 25%. There, there are incremental improvements potentially, but you could also argue that being 30% is better when you're very old. Not That's not an insult, but if you're in an age range where you're at greater risk for falls, for um, being, being on bed rest, having a little bit of extra body fat is actually health protective. So it's contextual. But I will say there is a lot of health benefit to be gained to get down to 35% if you're currently at 50%. And I would say 30% is probably a good goal for most people. Um, Diana asked, what if you're 66 years old? I would certainly say that you don't want to be above the 30s for most ages, I would say, is a pretty safe understanding. The issue is not that it's better to have high body fat. The issue is that it, let's say you're 50% body fat and you are in a place where um, you are older and it's hard for you to lose weight. And when you lose body fat, you're also at risk of losing muscle mass. Remember what I said earlier, when we lose weight, we become at a higher risk of losing body fat along with, I'm sorry, we become at a higher risk of losing muscle mass with that weight. So you're arguably better off being a little bit plush, a little bit cushy with more muscle mass than you are being a string bean with less muscle mass. The issue isn't that the fat itself makes you safer. It does a little bit. It cushions you when you fall, right? The issue is that trying to cut body fat lower and lower and lower when we're older comes with an increased risk of loss of muscle mass along with it. So whereas a very obese person who's losing body fat might only lose 20% muscle mass, a very thin, well, a fairly thin person losing body fat might lose 40 or 50% of their weight as muscle mass. That's not a good equation, right? You want it, you want the ratio to be much more fat than muscle mass. I hope this is becoming clear. So if someone came to me and said, I'm 50% body fat, which I have absolutely been in my life, I've been over that. Um, I would say, let's try and let you step it down. Let's get you to 35 and then see how you feel and function. But at the same time, it sounds like, um, yeah, so there you go. But, but Heather, what I'm reading, okay, good news here, because um, I thought you were smaller, um, is that you're for someone who's 5'2, having 97 pounds of lean mass is not bad. It's not bad. So, um, so what you're gonna want to do is remove some fat mass while preserving as much of that lean mass as possible. So that way, when you lose that fat, you're gonna get to the lean mass. So I would say wouldn't worry too much about your ideal weight. Um, I would just set your target at, at, from here 
getting your body fat percentage down while maintaining as much lean mass as possible. So I would just set incremental goals along the way. So, you know, I would say, oh, in six months or, you know, what, whatever speed you want, but like, let's say in six months, uh, okay, hold on. Let's say in six months. So let's say you do some resistance training along the way. Just so my math is easier. And you add three pounds of muscle. So now you've got a hundred pounds of muscle. It makes my math a little easier. But that it's totally doable over six months that you with good training, you might add three pounds of muscle mass. So um, especially if you are not currently training, there's newbie gains. So you can add a little bit more there. And so let's say in, in six months, you've gained three pounds of muscle mass because you're working out real good and you're getting enough protein. Um, and now you've lost, what's reasonable? Four, four times six, 20, 20 pounds of fat. So now at that point, you are, let's say 80 pounds of fat and 100 pounds of muscle. So now you're 180. And uh, that would be so now you're like 40% body fat, right? So it's, it's an improvement. And so you're just chunking it down. I didn't use a calculator on that, but somewhere in that range. Okay. So you're just going to start to chunk that down. I don't think you, I don't, I honestly don't think anyone ever needs to worry. Should I be 125 pounds or 127 pounds? As you get there, you'll know. So just pick a neighborhood, aim for that neighborhood, head to the neighborhood. You don't have to land on the right millimeter of sidewalk. Just, just aim for the neighborhood. All right. Um, Cheryl said, is it good to get a DEXA scan to find out fat and muscle mass? I find it can be helpful. Um, you can also use measurements to approximate. So if there's a DEXA scan available to you that includes your muscle mass, some DEXA scans just do um, bone density. So make sure they do uh, body composition. If it's a good starting place to do some calculations from. Some people get very depressed when they find out what their body fat percentage is. And if that's going to negatively impact you, then I would skip it. Because you know what direction you need to head in, right? Head there. Heather said, I meant more like my body's ideal weight, which, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so there are like ideal body weight charts. Um, and there are a range. And I think that's true of everybody. And I think if you have a lot of weight to lose, you can just pick a number that sounds good to you. Like when I was very, very heavy, I would have said like 190. If I hit 190, I'm going to be so happy because I'd been over 200 pounds since college. And I'd be like, 190 sounds so good. And then I hit 190 and I was like, mm, more, I would like more, but certainly I wasn't like, oh, I've gone in the wrong direction. It's just headed in that direction. So it's a hard question to answer because I think conceptually I look at it a certain way. Um, so it's hard to answer. I don't think anyone has a specific ideal number. It's about their body composition lining up with a number. And so, you know, that's going to depend where you get. Doxon says, how do we know what's a good amount of muscle mass? I mean, it's just kind of, you kind of have to, there are averages, I would say, um, and there are ranges. Uh, so you kind of look at it that way. I would say there's more, it, it, it's very, very challenging, um, to, to give an exact number, but it's more a feeling I know like, ah, oh, yeah, that's decent or wow, that's really low. Um, and, and it can be a range because some people are more muscular than others. Some people put on muscle easier than others. It's not an exact amount. I, I would certainly say that, I don't have a calculation, but you can look up, you know, what is appropriate. Is it, nobody has a perfect answer on what's a good amount of muscle mass, but I would say, um, I mean, the way you can kind of look at it is uh, knowing what your 
I like what weight range you're in and, and then looking at your fat mass. And if you're like, wow, I feel like this should be a good weight, but I'm still more body fat than I need to be. Then you might have low muscle mass because you only have fat and lean. Right. And so if you're, if you're, if your total weight, which is the combination of your fat and your lean seems appropriate, but yet you still seem pretty high body fat. Well, then your muscle mass is a little low. It's just a ratio. Joy says my face is looking slimmer. Thank you. My my cheekbones are coming out more. It makes me happy. Um, Docs and Gals says Renfro scale matches Excel Not for me. Um, the scales are just not. I mean, they're they're they seem accurate for some people. They're very inaccurate for other people. Uh, I don't trust the scales, but they're consistent. So, you know, if it works for you, fabulous. But I would say body measurements are more accurate than any of the home scales. Um, but you can, you certainly can use them like my scale, which said it was very accurate, says I have less body fat than my athletic boyfriend, which is ridiculous. He has like a third of the body fat I have. So, or more, less something. He's very low body fat compared to me. So that's wrong. Um, and so the scales, no, not so accurate. Um, but if you, but sometimes they, they match up. Like you're like, look, my Dex has said this and my scale said that great. They work better for some people than others. Um, I want to count on them too much. But I will say like you can use them as a consistent. If it's like if it seems right now, it's going to probably be right in an ongoing basis. They're very sensitive to things like hydration level though. So if you had a lot of water or a little water that's going to throw the results. That'll also throw a DEXA scan result though. All right, I've blathered on enough. We've come to the end of the hour. I hope that you're all doing awesome and I will see you next week. Um so if you want to join me for Keto Unstuck there is a link in the comments, but I'll also make sure it's at the top for the replay. I would love to have you. And hey, I understand that right now is a really tough time for a lot of people financially. There's this recession thing and it's very scary. And if you're somebody who says, like, I would really like to do this program and I'm in a terrible pinch right now, just please message me. I will see what I can do to make it work for you. Okay. I, I can't promise anything, but I'll do my very best because I don't want to leave anybody without the help they need. So uh, feel free to message me if you need to make some special arrangement. I will see what I can do. All right. Hopefully that helps. If you can afford it, great. Please pay for the program. It's how I can stay in business. <laughs> but if you, if you really can't, please don't feel like you can't come and talk to me and, and we can maybe work something out. Okay. All right. Bye guys.